Cannabis in Focus, where you get straight facts and expert opinion about medical cannabis. I'm Miriam Knight, and I'm delighted to have as my guest today, Dr. Perry Solomon. Dr. Solomon is the Chief Medical Officer of Hello MD, a telemedicine firm that connects would-be medical cannabis patients with cannabis-friendly doctors in California and New York. He received his medical training at Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons in New York, and he's a board-certified anesthesiologist and leading expert in cannabis therapeutics. Dr. Solomon is the Director of Cardiac Rehabilitation at San Ramon Regional Medical Center in Northern California, and he has over 30 years' experience as a medical care provider. Welcome, Dr. Perry Solomon. Well, great. Well, thank you for having me on the show and delighted to be here to help educate and talk to people about cannabis and medical efficacy of it. Absolutely. I'm very curious, as an anesthesiologist, what got you interested in cannabis? Um, well, I was, as, I, as you had mentioned, practiced anesthesia for quite a long time, and a mutual friend had put myself and the other two founders of Hello MD as an introduction, and we went to our first lecture, gave our first lecture between myself and Pamela Hadfield at a senior uh, a senior living facility in Northern California called Rossmore, where they had already had a cannabis club, which I was surprised about in the beginning, which is over three years ago. And we showed up, and there was about 100 members of the club already there, and 80 of them had already had their recommendations for cannabis. And I, quite frankly, as you know, one of my first exposures in that medical orientation for cannabis and medical conditions, I was, I was really quite surprised. And all of them had it for pain. They all used cannabis to help alleviate their, their pain, whether it be chronic back pain or it was arthritic pain and elbows, knees, joints whatever. And I was just stunned that these people had such great efficacy or relief from their pain from using medical cannabis and were able, as they all stated, to decrease or completely eliminate any any opioid use that they had been uh, prescribed by their physicians. And they absolutely preferred it and said, we are never going back to opioids because cannabis just works so terrifically. And I, I was amazed. I had, I, as you mentioned, went to Columbia, had a traditional medical school anesthesia training background, and I, I was just amazed that it had that much proof from just, from just these people that it worked. And then did due diligence and st- reviewed studies, um, of course, with the most of from out of the country because it's unfortunately difficult to do those types of studies here in the United States, but still valid studies. And I said, well, this really works. And there's more to it than just people using it to get high, which has been and still remains the stigma about cannabis Mm -hmm. to a great Mm -hmm. many people. Yeah. Well, kudos to you for having the intellectual curiosity to actually look into it. Uh, What is, what was the reaction of your medical colleagues? Um, it was, you know, at first it was mostly, because this was three years ago when we started Hello MD and this whole process started, and it was then the wink, wink, oh, you're using it for, you know, quote, medicinal purposes. And well, that, well, I'm not using it at all, but the people who are, you know, the people mm-hmm. who I'm seeing, and they claim, no, you're using it for, you know, these people are just getting high, it's just an excuse to be able to get cannabis and purchase it legally if you had a recommendation. And, uh, you know, when I explained to them that it was being used by these people for various medical conditions, pain being the number one, they were more curious about it as I had been and were able to say, listen, well, can you give me information about it? Who, you know, how can I learn? So, you know, they, most of them wanted to know the rationale because they had known me for many, many years and wanted to know what it was that, about it that I found so attractive to be able to recommend to various patients. And most of them didn't want to incorporate it into their practice per se as a prescription because they had the erroneous thought that getting involved with cannabis would lead them into trouble with the DEA 
being a Schedule One drug, etc., um, which is not the case. But they still didn't want to have that implication or be known as a quote pot doc. And all their patients were getting cannabis. People wouldn't refer their own patients to them because of this fear of you know someone just recommending cannabis to treat these these disease states that they had. Um, but they were curious to know about it and. As time went on, more and more physicians are really getting that curiosity because their patients are coming into them saying, well, doc, what do you think about cannabis? Mm-hmm. The patients, for the most part, are more educated than the physicians when they go into the office speaking about this. Sure, sure. I'm curious. You said that these doctors had the erroneous assumption that as a, um, a doctor in a, an institution, presumably funded by the federal government, that they were not allowed to prescribe cannabis. Uh, what well, is it, well, that's, well? That's true. You know, it, it, you know, most hospitals. No one except for the VA hospitals. You know, the most other hospitals don't aren't funded by the federal government. I mean, mm-hmm. the reason that the Veterans Administration hospitals have difficulty, the physicians there have difficulty in doing recommendations up until and even discussing cannabis with the vets that were there is because they're 100 percent government funded. Uh-huh. Most other most other hospitals, private hospitals, universities, etc., cetera, um, don't have that that stigma, not that well, not that stigma, but that type of funding where they can discuss it. And even some of them write recommendations for cannabis in in California. So they were under the impression that if they started doing that, the DEA would start looking at them more closely for whatever reason it was, because federally it still is a Schedule One drug, and the federal government, if they so chose to, could come in and have an issue with doctors or just it in general being prescribed. However, that has not been the case in over 15 to 20 years. There's been no interference by the federal government up to now uh, about doing that. Mm-hmm. So tell me about Hello MD. Uh, what's the concept behind it? We started because in 2014, in October, the Medical Board of California allowed tele-evaluations for patients to get a cannabis recommendation by a physician. Previously to that, physicians, patients would have to journey and find a brick-and-mortar doctor to go to if they could get there physically, if there was transportation, if the doctor office was in an area of town that they felt safe in or not, didn't want to go, or were charged an exorbitant fee by these brick-and-mortar doctors with who had storefronts. And so there was an opportunity. We said, well, listen, let's do this since they allowed it um, remotely using tele-evaluations. Let's do it remotely. Let's set, set up an, a, uh, a system whereby we can increase access to patients who weren't able to get to a physician physically to be able to see a physician remotely in the comfort of and privacy, quite frankly, of their home, office, or whatever, and talk to a physician who's qualified to be able to speak about medical cannabis relating to their conditions in a private, comfortable location for a reasonable price. And so we skyrocketed from essentially zero in in March of 2015 to now having issued over 70,000 recommendations in California, mostly in California. We opened in New York uh, several months ago, but most of them are still in California. And patients are, you know, love the fact that they're able to talk to someone, a physician in California, about their medical condition and what we would recommend they take to help treat it. And so we started with that concept and then realized that we needed how to build the education to the patients about it because patients just had questions not only from California but from all over the country and and the world. So we started developing communities of like-minded patients to be able to interact with each other and patients also on our site to ask questions about cannabis that would be answered by physicians, by patients in different geographic areas who have the same similar medical 
issues as well as manufacturers about products that they feel may help the person with their condition. And so it's grown to about 300,000 members across the country or and world for who want to go on our site, get credible information in a reliable way to get more information about cannabis and how it helps their medical condition. We're, we're essentially a health and wellness site. Um, we don't get involved in the recreational or adult use questions. Um, we are completely oriented to how cannabis helps people with their health and wellness and to help substitute cannabis for medic other uh, medications if it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. Do you have ongoing relationships with patients about their general health or is it specific to cannabis use? Right. At this time, it's specific for cannabis use and, and how it can help whatever condition that they, that they suffer from. That's mm -hmm. correct. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that this is a fantastic idea because of the anomalous position of cannabis since the, the, the 50s um, and the squashing of, of research and really any kind of uh, institutional knowledge about cannabis, the, the people are coming forward and creating their own repositories of knowledge and exchange. Um, exactly. And, and that's what and that's what we're that's what we're building on, and what we're trying to do by the same token is have essentially, um, and we are going to be instituting somewhat shortly a sort of a, a circle of care we call it in terms of being able to educate other physicians about cannabis because as a, when you we're essentially look we like to look at ourselves as just a consultant dealing with cannabis just like the mm -hmm. neurologist deals with sure. the neurological issues gi you know deals with the gi the gastrointestinal tract and so we want to be able to communicate back to the person's physician that yes this, they saw one of our physicians we recommended cannabis to them and so they have it on their record that they know that, um, you know, with the patient's consent, of course, that we're able to do this, um, that, that the patient is on using cannabis for this medical condition so that the next time the patient shows up, the doctor says, oh, I, you know, I got in touch, you know, hello, Wendy, contact me. I see that your how is cannabis helping you? And mm -hmm. by, the same, by that token, they're able to see the effect of cannabis with the patient itself and thereby educating the doctor also that it has efficacy in their, in, in their own patients. Right, right. Is there a particular demographic that's emerging as your main uh, client? Um, we, we see, you know, it used to be in the 30s and 40s. Um, it seems to be the study that we did in January of 2016 was that was the majority of the patients or 34, I think it was 34% of the patients were around that age. And we're seeing it slowly starting to skew to an older group of people, maybe 40s to 60s. Seen, and it, 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 we're not, it's not only from us, but everyone seems to see that skewing more, and I think it has to do with just people being educated about it more and more, that it's useful to have to sub a substitute, an alternative for their traditional medication. So we're, even though in California now you can don't need a medical recommendation to purchase cannabis unless the county or town you're living in only allows medical licenses for dispensaries, so people in those counties and towns still do need a recommendation. Um, but we're also seeing a surge of people who can buy it legally just walking in someplace, but again, they still don't know what it is to get, and they would prefer to get, a, even they don't need it, to get a recommendation just to be able to talk to a physician about what it is that they, we would recommend they mm -hmm. ask for when they go in. Because, you know, if you have a 50, 60, whatever, you know, year old person who goes in, you know, the, the, you know, some of these discussions that they may have with someone behind the counter who could be young enough to be their son or daughter and or may grandchild. not really the grand or their grandchild <laughs> exactly and you know i mean the, the there is still a counterculture out there about people who work in a dispensary and so sure. they may feel uncomfortable talking to that person in a, in a quite not private 
area, in a public area, about their their menopause problems, their problems sleeping, their anxiety. You know, someone standing right next to you, and you're hearing this private, personal medical discussion. It's it can be very uncomfortable, and they just say, you know what, I, I can't do this. I can't. You know, I'm not doing this. I'm gonna. I want to talk to somebody first, and then come in and know, or just get a delivery, get it delivered mm-hmm. to their home, which they can still do, but they have to know what to order. Right. Right. Tell us about the clinical database that you've amassed. You mentioned uh, some studies that you were involved in. We, uh, we did, the first one was we did just an internal study just in terms of demographics. That was, that was quite interesting and just in, as we were starting out as a year into the, the, the company. And it just gave us a kind of a snapshot at that point in time of the demographics, men, you know, men versus women, what they were using it for, for their medical conditions. And of course, number one then and still continues to be is people using it for pain is the number one um, uh, medical condition that people use it for. But the study that we did last year with uh, the University of California, Berkeley, was really um, the first of many that we did that really focused on cannabis and a medical condition. Um, We wanted to look at how cannabis was helping decrease opioid use, which as you know, and I'm sure your listeners know, is a huge problem in the United States, and not only in California, across the country and quite frankly across the world. And so we did a study at the time. It was uh, we got the highest number of people in a study like this. About 3,000 people um, enrolled in the study. These were all patients who got their recommendations through Hello MD. And we asked them essentially, were you able to decrease your opioid use? Did you? feel that the cannabis was more uh, effective than opioids for relieving your pain, et cetera. And this was all types of cannabis. It was this particular study wasn't specific for um, a brand or a way that people use it. It was just cannabis in general. And what we found was it almost, an almost doubling of the amount of people who were able to decrease their opioid use. We had 97% of the people who answered in the survey that they strongly agreed or agreed that they were able to decrease the amount of opioids that they used. Now, and before that, it was the last, the previous study was a less number than the 3,000, as well as they found it was 47% of the people who were able to decrease their opioid use. So because of education or because of just the large number, the fact that we were able to get that huge percent of people saying that was just really stunning. Um, that because obviously opioid overdoses, 91 people or more are dying a day, a day by prescription drug overdoses. And being able to, to decrease that by any number is hugely significant in terms of, you know, obviously lives lost, monetary costs, et cetera. So, you know, the fact that we're able to publish this, it was published in Cannabis and Cannabinoid Research and has been quoted, uh, it was downloaded over 130,000 times. Um, since it's been published in June 30th of last year. And it's just people say, oh my gosh, this really does decrease people's opioid use. And to be able to offer it as a solution to physicians to be able to say, because I, you know the DEA issue that I had brought up previously, counterwise, the DEA looks at people who prescribe too much opioids. So which obviously they have a number of because you have to do a triplicate form, a special form to be able to submit to the pharmacy. So that is very strictly being kept track of. So if they see a physician is prescribing too many opioids or continually prescribing opioids to many, many patients, the alarm bells start going off now um, that this person is a problem here. And so the DEA starts looking very closely. No physician wants to have that happened. So they prescribed too little narcotics and the patient says, well, what do I use now? I'm still in pain, et cetera. They, now they have an alternative that they can try other than having the patient just be in pain. There is an alternative for the doctor to be able to give to the patient or to recommend. Mm. I've also read that uh, opioid, you get resistance to it, and so you tend to increase your dosage over time to control pain, whereas if you take it together with cannabis, um, you don't have that uh, same effect. Uh, Cannabis seems to make the opioids more effective. 
Exactly. There's a synergistic mm-hmm. um, um, reaction between both of those so that you can increase, you could use the cannabis and therefore decrease their cannabis use. Um, and they were able to use that and, de- and again, in the study, decrease their, their use, therefore have less chance of an overdose by, because they're taking less cannabis, less, less opioids. And, you know, in, in the study, 81% of the people agreed or strongly agreed that cannabis just by itself was more effective than opioids to treat their pain. So mm-hmm. even using cannabis not, and not even touching the opioids, over 80% felt that that was significant enough and, and effective enough so they didn't even need to take opioids and therefore not risk any type of overdose from uh, the opioids as well as you know, it's not only the risks of opioids, it's just taking opioids by itself give you the complications of feeling. Some people feel nauseated, dizzy, constipation is a huge, huge side effect of any amount of opioid use. And so, you know, these are people who, uh, you know, do, don't want to have those side effects, would rather use cannabis instead. Absolutely. I just want to point out to our listeners the the real importance of having the kind of database that you have, because your uh, patients are buying cannabis on the market. That means they're buying cannabis of, of varying but high potencies, whereas university and hospital research tends to be forced to use cannabis from a single source from the University of Mississippi that is of a single strain and of inferior potency. So we don't really get the kind of information that you are able to get through your your database. So uh, hats off to you. Well, it's 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 something that we've you know are doing more and more and want to do with uh, you know other institutions and uh, you know the, what people are looking for essentially is you know, and all manufacturers want and the patients would like the same thing is tell me exactly what it is I should use to treat my specific medical condition. And we are, you know, attempting to be able to do that with various studies and surveys that um, will be coming out and will be, you know, instituting as time goes on to be able to go to a manufacturer and, you know, say, do you have, or because essentially what manufacturers do now is they label a product for X condition, let's say it's for insomnia, mm-hmm. and they sell and, and, and they can't mark, they can't do claims. In other words, they can't say this product works for insomnia because you have to show that it works or the, the FDA comes down on you for claiming something that doesn't, that doesn't work for that. So that they suggest that it may be used for insomnia, for example, and then when asked, well, how did you test this to know that it worked? And they would some some have said, well, we gave it to a couple of people and they fell asleep, and so we're going to market it for insomnia. Or we gave it to a dozen people, you know, twenty people, and they all felt sleepy after they took it for an hour. Well, you know, that's nice and it's good, but what we want to be able to do is to say, well, we have. 5,000 patients or 10,000 patients who use it for this medical condition, let's do some observational survey and study and see how it, how, what your product actually did for these 5,000 people. And then you have the strength of the numbers to be able to say, yes, this really did work. Or again, you may not be able to say that per se, but you'll be able to say, in an observational study of X number of people, this many found that it helped them go to sleep. And you're just stating facts versus making a claim. And so the strength that we're able to do and the, and the, and the, what we're able to do at Hello MD is to be able to help manufacturers and help institutions look at it from a different way. Mm-hmm. What would you say to a patient who is in pain but they're afraid of the stigma of using cannabis uh, and and worried about getting high? Well, there's different, because there's essentially two main components of of cannabis. There's THC, which essentially is the psychoactive effect of the cannabis, and there's CBD, cannabidiol, that is essentially the non-psychoactive effect of the component of cannabis. And so what we tell people, and if that, if they say, listen, I don't want to, I 
psychoactive effect is something I don't want to do at all or as minimized as possible. There's different ratios of cannabis with the THC and CBD. And so what we would recommend is for someone to take a higher ratio of CBD than THC Mm -hmm. and to be able to titrate or to adjust the dose that they take depending on the results that they get because that's you know quite frankly one of the more frustrating things that physicians as well as patients come across in that there's such an individualistic reaction to cannabis itself that one size does not fit all in other words and doctors have the same issue in terms of you say we'll take this one antibiotic and take it every six hours and i know that if you get it from cvs walgreens rite aid whatever this antibiotic is going to have exactly this amount of component in it that is reliable no matter where you get it and unfortunately cannabis still isn't like that and everyone's reaction to cannabis is different so what works for you and you who someone else that has the same medical condition may not work the same way and so there is some experimentation individually that people have to do and be willing to do to be able to get the efficacy or the results that they're looking for like you said for for pain or for insomnia for example um, you know, someone says, I have trouble sleeping. It's, well, there's two different parts. Do you have trouble going to sleep or do you have trouble staying asleep? Because there'd mm-hmm. be two different types of cannabis that you use in each of those situations. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are, as you said, fewer legal restrictions on the sale of CBD products because they're not psychoactive. But uh, as a result, you find a lot of them on the market. And... Um, what conditions is CBD best for, but what should you look for when you're selecting a CBD product? Well, yeah, there, you, you do see, even though, again, the, the DEA claims that um, CBD still can't, is, is part of the cannabis plant and any component with CBD is still Schedule One product. Um, and so strictly, legally speaking, you, you, the shipping of CBD is, classified the same as cannabis, as cannabis, anything with THC. Um, that being said, there are companies that do ship all over the country CBD products. And you might find them on the internet, you might find them on the, in a magazine or, or whatever. And the issue with CBD is that it depends what the CBD comes from. In other words, it can be plant derived from cannabis itself and then extracted or it can be extracted from hemp. So hemp CBD and cannabis CBD is two different things. In other words, the CBD that's sold in the mass market, a lot of this hemp comes from overseas, and you need a large volume of hemp to be able to extract CBD. And so what has been shown to happen is in some countries there's many pesticides being used there's poisons there's there's fertilizers that are being put into the ground to make the plants grow so you have the plant absorbing all of that um the toxins and pesticides etc and then a large and then it's being shipped to for example the united states or wherever and this being the cbd that's extracted essentially gets concentrated from these hemp plants where you don't really know how they're produced or what's given to them to help them grow. So all those toxins and pesticides get concentrated into the CBD that you would purchase in a, you know, in a routine type of environment. Um, so anyone who gets CBD and wants to purchase a CBD product, I would caution them to know the etiology of where they got the CBD from. Where was mm-hmm. this? Even if it's, if it's hemp, you want to know. If the, person, if the company says, yes, we grow our own hemp, it's in Colorado, it's in here, it's here, and we do our own extraction, we do our own analysis, and thereby controlling what it is you're taking when you purchase a CBD product. And you may be using it for inflammation, for anxiety, things that you want to be able to, to, to be able to use in a safe manner. But, you know, I'd caution everyone to know where the etiology, where the hemp comes from before they use any type of CBD product. 
And I, I, I think that's a caution that applies to any kind of cannabis product, not just CBD. It's Correct. Just, and, and, and CBD in, seems in, to be more of a, a CBD sales seem to be more of a Wild West uh, atmosphere. Co- correct. And, and what's being sold now, you know, and, and in California, as of January, there do have to be labels on uh, cannabis products showing the amount of, of pesticides, the mm-hmm. amount of, uh, you know, THC and CBD, et cetera, that's in the, the what, what's being sold. Um, and the stuff that you get, again, that's being mailed to you that you might find on the internet is, you know, there's no restrictions on those. And those are the ones I'd be leery about wanting to purchase because you don't know what it is you're getting. Absolutely. Now um, you've mentioned cannabis helping people reduce or eliminate dependency on opioids. Can people become addicted to cannabis? Um, You know, you can become addicted to to anything and studies have shown it's, it's, you know, there is a percent of people, I, you know, it's been quoted between 6 and 9% that have an issue with a dependency on cannabis. Um, and whether it's a psychological dependency, um, which is most likely the case versus a physical addiction, like you get addicted to opioids and go through withdrawal, um, it's a completely different um, uh Reference and mm-hmm. so an addiction to cannabis is something that you know is not really heard of. It's more of a dependency, and the difference is more of the physical problems that you'd have withdrawing from one versus the other. Um, yeah. uh, you know, but 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 people still need to be careful about taking it. It is something that can be psychoactive. It is something that can affect them. And so when you're using it for that type of a medical condition, again, going low and slow until you go to get to the point where it's working for your condition, that's where you stop. Right. Can you overdose on cannabis? No, there's never, there has never been, they've tried, they've, they've tried overdosing animals or mice with cannabis and they've been completely unsuccessful. I mean, it would take pounds and pounds and no one would be able to, to, to do that. So there's been, and people have tried, it's called the LD50, the lethal dose 50, and there just is no number, it's infinite because um, you either would go to sleep or that's pretty much about it. I go to sleep and then wake up, not, mm-hmm. not go to sleep to sleep but it, you you would it, no there, there there is no overdosing with with cannabis now many older people are on a laundry list of drugs are there any cautions about drug interactions the, i mean and that's why we want to inform the doctors and the patients that there is you know these are it is a medicine and needs to be taken uh, appropriately an example would be for example warfarin or a blood thinner Mm-hmm. Um, that people take for, you know, getting consistent blood clots and the doctor may put them on warfarin. And, you know, there have been reports of high doses of CBD interacting with some of the enzyme mechanisms in the liver so that the amount of um, uh, warfarin that's metabolized in the liver is decreased. So you have an increased amount still circulating because you're taking such a high amount of CBD and it competes with the warfarin for degradation, for breakdown. And so that's a specific example of something where if patients are taking warfarin and they say, well, let me just start taking some CBD for my my pain, my inflammation, whatever, um, and they take a lot, there may be issues with um, bleeding times or bleeding increasing. So we recommend, and the same thing applies with chemotherapeutic drugs for cancer that some patients are on. Again, those same drugs get metabolized in the liver, and one of the um, enzyme systems called the cytochrome P450 enzyme system helps degrade that, and CBD can interfere with that by competing. And so we recommend no matter what, if you're on a bunch of medications or taking it for different medical conditions, to absolutely inform your physician uh, or healthcare work professional about the fact that you're using the X, Y, and Z at the same time. And we tell people, listen, it is not a substitute. People say, well, um, and you read stories about um, people using cannabis to cure 
to quote cure cancer or reading um, uh, anecdotal stories of you know, I had this huge mass and it was cancer and, and I used cannabis and three weeks later it was gone. Well, I and almost all physicians say, uh, you know, who are involved with cannabis say that, well, cannabis does not cure cancer. It helps with various aspects like chemotherapeutic uh, nausea and vomiting that can happen when they're treating with that, but they should not substitute cannabis for uh, other modalities until they talk to their physician first, specifically, again, using cancer as an example. Mm -hmm. Although it does have a stimulating effect on the immune system, doesn't it? it? It it does, and there have been in vitro, which means in the lab um, studies, that various types of types of cannabis can kill some cancer cells. Um, again, that is far and away far different than saying it cures cancer in a person. Mm So, um, you know, it does have, it has been shown in the laboratory to have that effect and in some small animal models, but to extrapolate that to and apply it to humans into substance for the person to say, well, I have whatever breast cancer and I'm on chemo. I don't want that. I'm just going to put this cannabis ointment on the, on my breast and it's going to cure the cancer and stop everything else, I I would say, please don't do that and continue to see your physician about it. And that just points out more strongly why we need research in this area. It's true. And it's very true. Uh, And, uh, you know, the way the Schedule I drug, and you alluded to it before, is that the studies now all need to get their cannabis from Mississippi and in, in whatever strengths that they're able to supply. And so to go through that, you know, can take several years to be able to get everything done. So whether or not cannabis, you know, people talk about, because as you said, cannabis is a Schedule One drug. There's no medicinal, there's no medical reason to do it. People talk about uh, rescheduling it to maybe a Schedule Two or Three, which would be the same as, you know, a Percocet or Vicodin or something like that. And I am of the opinion that it should be deschedulized altogether and make it equivalent to alcohol where you have to be a certain age. You get it, um, you know, whether it be at a pharmacy or wherever, and you use it to, with, as long as it's documented and, again, needs to be consistent across the boards, and you use it to your comfort level, just like you would drinking alcohol. You drink alcohol until you pass out. That's one way. You can also die of alcohol poisoning. You, you, you can't do that with cannabis, but the, the position of making it a different schedule so the doctors can prescribe it leaves us in, a, in this type of situation where a patient sits down in front of us and they say, doctor, I'm in pain. And you go, okay, you have two prescription pads. Um, both schedule two or three drugs, let's say, and one you write a prescription for Percocet, take one Percocet every four hours, here's number 20, and et cetera, et cetera. You know exactly what it is you're getting. And you have the other prescription pad that says cannabis. Well, what do you write down? Do you write down a puff, a drop? <laughs> a, what exactly do you write yeah. down? There's there's nothing consistent in what the physician would write down to be able to recommend it or prescribe it to their patient. And so it's a real problem in terms of rescheduling it because that's exactly what will happen. The doctor just doesn't know what to write down and can't write down a consistent thing because there's no consistency in, in the marketplace right now. Well, it's still very early days, but uh, it's. I think the... Uh, database of uh, information is growing all the time. Um, where Charlotte's Web, uh, the uh, use of cannabis in uh, juvenile epilepsy um, is well documented. And I think Sanjay Gupta's uh, documentary was really a watershed in awakening um, consciousness about uh, and pressure for uh, legalization of medical marijuana. Are there any populations who shouldn't be using cannabis? 
Um, we we um, don't do recommendations for people under 18, um, only because we um, don't have the familiarity and the, you need to follow the patients much, much more closely um, who are using it for that reason, for, for epilepsy. Um, I think that there's the only, the, the populations that shouldn't be using it for, and sometimes I get into uh, you know, heated arguments are w about this is with uh, pregnant or breastfeeding women, um, and it, you know, and it's mainly a issue of harm to uh, an unborn fetus one and two to a, a young, you know, a several month old um, person if you're breastfeeding and using cannabis because it all does get extracted into the breast milk and does go into the bloodstream uh, of an unborn child and. People talk about uh, a study that the, the quote Jamaican study that's over 35 years old, uh, where they followed I think it's 50 something children uh, up until the age of five and found there was quote no ill effects. Um, and so people talk about that all the time. And you know, here is a, an isolated event with cannabis that they were actually smoking. In a, in a concentration that was unknown in terms of what was a THC, CBD, the concentration of the, fa of the components of the cannabis were unknown. And now you have cannabis that's immeasurably stronger. There's many different types of cannabis that are out there uh, and tinctures and ways to administer it. And so it's really, you're comparing apples to oranges when someone says, Cannabis. It's like, you know, tell me about the, 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 the cell phones that you had 35 years ago. How did you make a phone? Yeah, it, it, it just doesn't make any sense. And yeah. so, you know, and but people still do talk about that. I would not, and our, our physicians do not recommend, uh, don't, don't recommend, uh, do the recommendations for those type of, uh, of women who have that. And I do understand that, that it does help with nausea and morning sickness is something that some women do have. And there are proponents, not us, of people who say low doses of cannabis can help with nausea and not cause any harm to your child, to your unborn child. And to that, I'd say that in fact may be true, but you're essentially uh, you know, you pay your money and you take a chance as mm -hmm. to whether or not it did have an effect on your child. You will never know um, what the child would have been like sure. before or after using the cannabis. And here it is, you're responsible for the health and well-being of your child. You know, do you continue to, you know, w why take that chance is, is kind of our, our philosophy. Absolutely. In what areas do you think cannabis is most beneficial for elders? Pain. I think pain is number one. I, mm -hmm. I think that um, using using cannabis to help pain, which it still is the number one reason that people take cannabis, um, would be um, uh, would be pain, and they would be able to do that. So right now, uh, that's that's the number one. So I, that's in terms of. Um, what, were you, what are you asking again specifically? Well. Uh, there have been a lot of studies recently about the use of cannabis for dementia. Mm -hmm. And it can help. It, it, it seems that it helps a little bit for that. In other words, using a high CBD type of product to hopefully decrease dementia may in fact be something that there's be very little harm in doing it, and it could perhaps help as well to decrease that dementia slash Alzheimer's type of uh, scenario that older people are going through. There have been suggestions that it could either delay it or help remedy it. Again, uh, because there's such a varying degree of dementia as it comes and goes, you know, it's hard again to be able to say, oh my God, the study showed that it worked, unless you have, again, a large number of people doing it and being able to use the end, the strength of the numbers to be able to show that. Um, well, I expect that this is a fertile area for your database research. For sure. Oh, absolutely. Um, we just have to be able to, you know, get the number of people to be able to do that and to find manufacturers or product to be able to essentially test on these people to see if it 
if it does work. And again, it's also something that would be a long, longer term study because, you know, the, the progression needs to go on over months and possibly years to be able to see something like that. It's not as if, you know, they take some tincture under their tongue and in one month they're bright eyed and bushy tailed and feel great. Uh, I, 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 wish that, I wish that was the case, um, you know, for many people, but I don't, I, I, I don't foresee that happening. I see, you know, perhaps to a trial of people who do take it and obviously a trial who don't and see in a large number whether or not X number of people get you know, it seemed to progress more than another group in terms of dementia, Alzheimer's uh, issues. It does, you know, there is neuroprotection to it for, for sure. It's been shown uh, that mm-hmm. that's true. Um, but, you know, how that reflects in an elder population in um, this dementia kind of remains to be seen. But again, is there a harm in pe- people using it? And again, the answer to that is no, mm-hmm. uh, because there's no drugs right now to help treat it in the first place. Right, right. Now, you mentioned uh, neuroprotection. I know a lot of uh, uh, sports people are talking about using it for uh, traumatic brain injuries and CTE. Um, But they are running up against the barrier of uh, not being able to pass urine tests. So um, what do you think should be the policy toward the use, the wider use of cannabis in healthcare? Well, I mean, for, for the, for sports, that's a, a, a very, you know, involved subject. And um, as a matter of fact, Marvin Washington is part of the lawsuit uh, that's going on today or yesterday in hearing, hearing about it in Washington, you know, suing to be able to do that. And Marvin is an ex NFL player who, uh, you know, feels that it's used in neuroprotective wise to be able to be used in players, uh, you know, across the board in football. And football's, you know, one of the places where obviously, you know, CTEs get seen quite frequently and study after study seems to show that uh, these people over a period of time with these even small concussions do get uh, mental issues down the road, emotional issues, et cetera, from chronic concussions. Um, and so cannabis can help protect the brain from that type of inflammation. And the, the, like, for example, the National Football League realizes that their players are using it and recently just increased the amount of THC from 15 to 30 nanograms um, when they get tested because they realize that if they kept the level the way it was before, they'd get many more players who would show positive, and they say, well, let's increase the dose, uh, the, the amount, so we can't find that many people. But, you know, National Hockey League has no policy for it. So, you know, and the, the Basketball Association, again, say, seems to have a look away, don't ask, don't tell, as baseball does as well. And, you know, football is the last remnant of sports whereby, you know, they're pretty draconian if the, it happens that they have a problem with the people continuing to play. And I think that, you know, between Marvin and a bunch of uh, Eben Britton, you know, are a bunch of, you know, ex-football players who are real strong proponents of ban- of stopping this ban of, uh, of cannabis for these type of incidents, these type of players. Yes, you should use it. It'll help you down the road by protecting your brain from the injuries that you're absolutely going to be suffering. It's really so frustrating when you think of all the people who could be helped by uh, this benign form of pain relief and cannot use it because of their job. I know a lot of people I've spoken to um, with chronic migraines, with fibromyalgia, can't use it because their companies do drug testing. And, you know, that's the, you know, Colorado found that if in construction, that if they tested their uh, applicants and their people on the job for cannabis, they'd have no one being able to work. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, so essentially they've stopped testing um, for, for, for THC in, in the workplace. And there's just a, a law that's trying to be passed in California saying that off duty, off when you're not at work, and you you can you it's okay to use cannabis as long as you're not it's not apparent or it's 
decreases your functionality when you do get to work. Um, you know, except in terms of where, you know, there's you know, patient, you know, there's uh, uh, people's safety involved or there's federal guidelines that, again, they have to, they have to follow. But, you know, uh, there was a lawsuit, I think it was in Colorado, where, you know, the person was fired because the company had a no tolerance policy for drugs and he was tested positive and they fired him and he said, I have a medicinal card in in Colorado to use it. And they said, we don't care. We have a, a zero tolerance policy. And, you know, there, there is an argument to be made for a company being able to do that. Um, if someone was using cannabis on the job, um, but if someone needs their medication off the job, I believe the patient should, uh, should have uh, the ability to use it as long as it doesn't affect his or her you know, performance on the job. Yeah. Well, I think this is where education is so critical. Education of our uh, population, education of physicians, and education of our lawmakers. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And, and, you know, the lawmakers take their cue from the public, which is why it's what 30 states now or, you know, cannabis is, has medical uh, laws that are okay. And, you know, the, the lawmakers just, you know, parrot what their populations are saying for, for the most part, not, not all the time, but for the most part. So I, I think that as more people become aware that it's okay for as a medicine that they communicate it to their, their, their lawmakers with congressmen or senators saying, listen, why doesn't our state allow medical cannabis? And quite frankly, you know, doing it in terms of, unfortunately, it's just California and New York that allow tele-evaluations of patients. All the other states that allow it make the person go to a physician's office, which I think is wrong. And, uh, you know, patients can only do that if they happen to live near a physician that recommends it or mm -hmm. of being able to evaluate for it and don't have transportation issues, privacy issues, etc. So, you know, there are states that have just done it willy-nilly and just said, oh, no, you have to go see a doctor. He's the only one that can do it. You can't do it remotely. While I think it's almost every other state in the country allows tele-evaluations for other various types of medical evaluations, only those two, New York and California, allow tele-evaluations, um, which I think decreases the access of people being able to get their medication. Yeah. Well, I wish uh, Hello MD best of luck in developing its footprint in New York. You're pretty well established in California now, aren't you? Correct. We've, we, like I said, we've done over close to 70,000 recommendations, and we are, we've been here, we're the oldest and first one did it, doing tele-evaluations. Uh, like I said, we started in March uh, 2015, and so we've been, we've been added, and we're recognized you know, across the state as being able to do the evaluations as well as, you know, offer people a, a place to go to be able to communicate in the communities of different medical conditions and to get information that's valid because like I said, you can go online and, and, you know, get five different people saying, yes, this cured my cancer. And, you know, again, that's something that is anecdotal is, and is wrong. And, you know, again, you can't believe everything. If you, if you want to know the definition of fake news, that's it. <laughs> um, you know, um, we, we don't have any fake news at hello MD. Now, you do have these communities, so if somebody is out of state, um, not in either California or New York, can they still go onto your website and join the community? Absolutely. They just have to sign up with the website. They don't have to buy anything, and they, obviously they can't. Um, you know, crossing state lines, we don't, we don't service, uh, you know, do anything like that. But they can absolutely join HelloMD and enter into communities and ask questions on our site and, or ask if questions have been asked before. There's a, there's a big page there where to ask you, type your question in, and someone can put in fibromyalgia, uh, pain, migraines, whatever, and all the answers and questions that people previous to them are able to uh, be seen like that. And what they're also able to do is say, ask a question for someone that, let's say someone is in 
whatever, Maryland, and mm-hmm. they ask you a question, I live in Maryland, what type? Because every products are different in different states also. In other words, you can't get X product in every state. Like California is the most liberal in terms of you know, pretty much anything here. But let's say in New York, you know, an edible is you can't get an edible. So what would someone use in California? So, yeah, I use edibles. And someone in New York says, well, I can't get an edible here. What do, I, what do you recommend? Someone will have answered that question already. Right. And the website is hellomd.com? Correct. There you have it. Well, it's been fascinating, and we can go on all day, but we don't have the time. (laughs) I could talk all day if you want. (laughs) I want to thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Perry Solomon of HelloMD. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you having me, and uh, you know, people can go on the site, get more information, and uh, you know, he- he- educating the public and physicians is essentially what we, what we was our main focus and what we want to concentrate on. Great, and thank you, my dear listener, for being with us today. I'm Miriam Knight for Cannabis in Focus. Goodbye.